My guest is Dr. Simon Michaud, who has a PhD in mining engineering. He is Australian by birth and is associate professor at Geological Survey of Finland. Simon, tell us about your work and your, your research and what's the latest in that? <clears throat> okay. So last time we spoke, I told you a little bit about well, the, the, the summary, tip of the spear of the work to actually look at if we were to phase out fossil fuels completely as a whole system, what would that look like? You know, um, if we were to apply the existing plan as we know, uh, as our um, policymakers believe it's going to happen, solar panels, wind turbines, um, electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cells. All right. So if we were to look at that, um, how big is the task and what, how much metal do we need? And can we get metal from somewhere else? Uh -oh. Can we get metal from recycling? Can we get metal from mining? And if it, and uh, uh, can mining production keep up or is it reserves or is it resources or <clears throat> do we have to go back to the drawing board? And the simple answer was, we the problem's too large and we have to go back to the drawing board. It's not going to go the way we, we thought. Now, I started this in August, 2021. I've now presented this work 197 times to a range of audiences. Um, so this, uh, um, and from all over the world, uh, about 40% or 30% of the time I was presenting it to government in some form. So this is not being rejected and it's been, it's been heard and understood by people in positions of authority. Um, the responses have been very interesting. Um, uh, and uh, some of the pushback I've got on social media uh, was was able to sort of shape what work went next. And that went in a, um, when I started this work, for example, uh, the idea that wind and solar needed a buffer at all wasn't really understood. Hmm. It wasn't in the literature at all. And uh, <clears throat> so, all right, so how much buffer does it need? And does it need a buffer? Yes, it does. How much? And what, what did the literature have to say? And, and it was very, very sparse at the time. And so policymakers of the day believed that whatever buffer they needed, it would be a battery bank of some, some sort. Now, they weren't thinking in terms of resource constraints at all. They said, it's fine. You know, yeah, it's all good. We, we, we're just going to pay for it. And, and, and it all will work out. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, what was interesting was, okay, I put the numbers to that, and the size of that buffer, you know, I, I, pick, I picked 28 days. Now, the reason I picked 28 days was I thought it was conservative. Looking at the solar radiance charts, if, if wind and solar now take 76% of the energy mix, and solar's half that, so now we've got like more than one third of the total energy mix is now solar. It's so large, it can't be balanced off something else. It has to be internally balanced. So looking at solar radiance between the difference between sun, the summer and winter, 12 weeks was a conservative. Uh, 12 weeks is about what it appears it needs to be. And there's actually a couple of references to support that now, because there wasn't back then. I picked 28 days because I found a reference saying, you know, one month. And 28 days to me was a conservative estimate. But my goodness, even at that level, the, the size of the battery bank is 30 times the size of the electric vehicle fleet, just the sheer size and volt. And uh, conventional thinking at the time now believes they only need four to six hours, which would be fine if, if we're only managing the day-to-day -day fluctuations, supply and demand and, and all that. But uh, they hadn't considered the difference between, say, winter and summer, and they hadn't considered the massive swings in power production and wind that can be as much as, you know, like 50, 60% and can last, you know, four or five days. You can have a lull four or five days. So, <clears throat> and the size of that peak di dictates how big the buffer should be. And and so it's, and the size of the peak is actually what's controlling that. Anyway, so when I put all that out there, that, that created a lot of angst and rage. Everything else was a straightforward calculation. Like it, it was, you know, uh, also, at the time when I started, there was there was no real understanding of what battery chemistry would actually be in the market, what market share of battery chemistry would be, and that work wasn't done. And so I just had to pick one, and the one I picked was NMC811, and that caused a lot of rage in the beginning too, because by the time the report came out and people read it, 
there was information. And so, so I found this is a very sort of disingenuous debate. People aren't playing fair intellectually uh, with regard to um, discussing this. So what other says, the, the moment something new comes out, you know, the latest uh, toy or the latest technology, they will use that to say the work that's being done and that's been published uh, debunks it, therefore, blah, 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 blah. And it is, but when you actually try and look at a lot of these technologies, they're not in a form that can be inserted in the same calculation. For example, um, a lot of the new battery chemistry for, say, uh, sodium, uh, sodium based or fluoride based, which I support, there's no information out there for, in terms of how much kilograms for metal per megawatt of battery and how much performance, you know, they, uh, how, what, what kind of performance would they actually have in, in actually, you know, if they were in electric vehicles. And, and, and that's until I get that information, we can't really include that in the analysis. So, so yeah, and so, so I'm finding this is a very sort of frustrating environment to, to work in, that, that something as important as this, we haven't sort of been through the basics. Right, so, so it went from um, battery chemistries to, all right, battery banks in general, and they said, well, okay, the buffer, if it's going to be that size, the next fallback position was, well, it'll be pumped hydro then. And also, we well, can't have pumped hydro at that level. So then they came back with a list of uh, the, the one study was 600,000, another study was 510,000 sites worldwide. And I go, well, gosh, you know, good luck getting that zone. But, but let's say even if you did do that, how much fresh water would that tie up? And most of them are not near the coast, so it has to be fresh water. Hmm. And, uh, oh, gosh, as a, as a storage thing, well, how much water would that tie up? And um, what I found was that was... Uh, the 28-day buffer would have been about half of the water withdrawal, freshwater withdrawal from the global hydrological cycle. And 12 weeks, that would have been nearly twice the existing withdrawal. And so th these numbers are too huge. That, that will never happen. It's mm -hmm. not sustainable. So pumped hydro can't do it. And the next thing to fall back on was hydrogen. We will store energy with hydrogen. Now, the problem is we don't have the technology to store hydrogen or transport it in large volumes, right? Uh, we, we just can't do it. But then there's the thing, hydrogen's not an energy source, it's an energy carrier. And at the moment, you've got to make it. And normally we make it with gas, which is, you know, quite viable. But if you're not gonna use gas anymore, not fossil fuels, then how much electrical power will you need? And so for every kilogram of hydrogen, you get 15 kilowatts when you put it through a fuel cell. So, but if it takes 52 kilowatt hours to make that hydrogen then and compress it into a 700 bar tank, then you've got about a 28% round trip. And so if you need to store something of the order of 2000 terawatt hours a year of power using hydrogen, you've got to create so much power that the power, power grid will have to expand significantly. Like we're, to, we're talking like, like up to 80% on more power on top of what I've calculated just to produce that buffer. And some of that power will have to come from wind and solar, which will turn need a more uh, a further buffer. So, so uh, hydrogen is not a goer either. So, so the, the sequence is this, pumped hydro won't work, hydrogen won't work, battery banks won't work. So then you come to the point, well, if we can't do a power buffer storage, that means wind and solar are not viable as a support power system. And it says, all right, so now the task is, can we develop an electrical technology that can handle variable power? Because at the moment, our computers need, uh, in a very narrow efficiency window, same current, same voltage, same frequency, uh, all the time, in a sinusoidal, a clean sinusoidal power. And so what if we would develop a technology that could cope with, with uh, rough variable power somehow? And so far, that idea hasn't gained traction at all. But if we did that, we wouldn't need the buffer. Mm -hmm. So I say, if you're going to work this problem, you need to work it like this. And and so uh, so a, a set of solutions are now uh, um, uh, coming together. So where things are at now is I've presented this work to quite a few people now, and they've had essentially the same result each time. So the the, the, the several reactions. One was shock. You know, they're, they're completely unprepared for what I presented to them. 
Second was they couldn't refute the numbers even when they're given the time to do so, because sometimes they'll go back and present three and four times to the same group. And right, and so the, the third reaction was what they asked me what they should do. Now, these are our leaders. These are our people in charge of everything with all their resources and all their study, and they're asking me, right? <laughs> and, so, and so it turns out I'm possibly in, in, in one of the best positions uh, of, of, of people to actually see what is needed. And since uh, over the last year or so, I'm starting to put together a, a, a plan, as in what must happen, what form must it take, what could we do? Now, I'm also working with the guys from the Club of Rome. Uh, I'm working with a lot of degrowth scholars. You know, hang is the system has to shrink down in size and simplify and, you know, uh, fossil fuels are going, uh, but but they're the most calorific dense system we've seen so far. And what do we do? And, uh, you know, there's, there's two sectors that need surgery. One is our industrialization uh, and the waste plume that comes off that. But the other is our agriculture, you know, our food production, and they both need surgery. So they're the two fundamental areas that we must actually initiate change and create a new society in. And so, so um, I'm also embedded in the circular economy research um, in Europe. And I'm, so, so I'm, I'm looking at those ideas and some of them are useful, some of them are not. And so in that melting pot mix, a plan is starting to emerge. And so where I'm at now is looking about developing that plan and deploying that plan and actually taking it further. And uh, yeah. So what I hear you saying so far is that, you know, when it comes to solar and wind, they're both intermittent. They're going mm -hmm. to vary according to the amount of sun, the amount of wind. Mm -hmm. So you're going to need a buffer. You've explored different possibilities for buffers, such as pumped hydro, hydrogen, and battery banks. And you're looking at the resources that would be required for those. You say the resources are coming up short. So, mm -hmm. and then people are coming back to you and saying, okay, we can't refute your data. So what are we going to do? So what, mm. what, what should we do? So people are throwing solutions at me in terms of, we, we tend to as a society want magic solutions. You know, we, we want a simple solution that doesn't involve us changing anything. They want someone to invent a technology that suddenly changes everything and it's cheap and they don't have to worry about it and life can continue on without any change in behavior. Uh, and ideally they want to hear good news stories like we're going to be rich and that um, because we've always had growth all our lives that it should be a growth thing. Like the, the future should be more complex and larger than the past. Thus, you know, we can all expand. And so a number of things has to happen simultaneously. Now, we, we've backed ourselves into a corner where we can't deal with these problems one at a time. We've got to deal with them all at once. And I've come to the conclusion that you can't, or, or it's, it's instead of actually going to an existing system and saying, we now want to um, improve an existing system and make you know, fundamental changes, that system will fight for its own survival and any new ideas will be killed off right before they can actually sort of establish themselves. It is actually easier now to go to a completely greenfield site where there's nothing and start again and build an entirely new system in a small form, in a simple form, and actually let it grow in complexity according to these boundary conditions. Right? And so we've got to reinvent our transport. And like in, and instead of ICE technology, it's got to be something else. Uh, um, so instead of this, we, we, we've got this thing called the car, but before the car was the horse and cart. And the idea where you had these this four-wheeled cart and you put a horse in front of it and it could carry stuff around from, from one place to another. And so all we did was invent a horse and cart without the horse, right? But it's the same basic principle. So now with the electric vehicle, we're taking the ICE engine out and we're putting the electric propulsion engine in. And we think that'll work. And it does work on a small scale, but we can't scale it up for everyone. So, so we've got the basic idea that we've got to transport large amounts of people and, 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 and material goods. How do we do that? Right. And so that has to be reimagined completely differently. And we're able to start from the point of this is what we need to do. We need to transport people and goods from one place to the other around a city settlement and between city settlements 
How do we do that? And then, then that comes back to, well, what energy source are we going to use? And so energy and technology arrive at the same time. So now we've now got to reinvent our energy sector. In fact, energy has got to come first, and that dictates what can happen after that. Then we've got to reinvent our food production. So instead of using petrochemical uh, industrial fertilizer, which is really, really not help, it's, it's not working. Long, long term, we're, we're degrading land at a phenomenal rate. We are, we are taking fertile arable land and we're sterilizing it into dirt, right? So we've got to reestablish our relationship with the planet in context where we understand that we're part of the environment and we've got to work with the environment, not against it. And we've got to do it in terms of, instead of actually exploiting those natural resources to, you know, for our own personal gain and, and benefit, we've got to be think in terms of stewardship. We are stewards of the planet. We are stewards of the land. And if we're not good stewards, we're going to be removed in one way or another. Right. So, so then, then there's the ideas of, well, can permaculture help us or, or regenerative agriculture help us? The answer is yes, but they need to be uh, evolved in a different system. Right. So everything needs to be assembled to, at, at once. Now, both of those implications of re reinventing energy, reinventing technology and reinventing food production involve a radical the different social contract. How do we interact as a society? So these are the, this is the chain reaction that must happen. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So if we go to a greenfield site, start up a uh, a small innovation um, settlement, and we start small. So instead of saying we will now make a city of twenty million people, go. Like systems theory tells us, we've got to start simple and small and evolve over time. You can't make a complex system as is, or, or at least it doesn't seem to work uh, in the past. So you've, you've got to recognize and honor the fact that you've got to start small and understand what your structure is and evolve into it. At the very heart of its energy. Now, if we're not going to use oil, gas and coal, then we've got to look at what do we use energy for? So now we've got back to the idea of degrowth. Contract our society size. So it becomes simpler um, and we collapse the just-in-time supply grid instead of across six continents across the world, collapse it into a single city, on, on, but not for everything, for one or two strategically important objects or uh, units, like an electric motor. All the point from sourcing the raw materials from, is it from a mining source, is it from a recycling source or whatever, to get that metal process it, refine it, and then manufacture it, and then produce the finished good and use the finished good all in one city. Right, and so if we can do that with, a, say, an electric uh, motor, and we can do that with, say, a ball bearing factory. Um, and, okay, so, so, so one unit of, say, a ball bearing unit has many applications. So we're now actually going to design our technology and system around a small, comparatively small number of components where we accept a reduction in performance in exchange for the ability to manage our own value chain from one end to, to the other. Right. So, okay, back to energy. So fossil fuels won't do it. Renewables in their current form require too much effort with not enough exchange coming back to be useful. That's, that's just, you know, uh, um, they're not dense enough especially when we actually want to rebuild everything. If, if you want to sort of not only rebuild, uh, uh, take out the, the existing society that's so complex, replace it with something else, then clean up the oceans, then you know, replenish the land that's been you know, uh, sterilized and grow our food somehow different. Meanwhile, the population's growing more and more than ever before. You know, we've painted ourselves into a corner on that. That's not going to work. So we need an energy dense system. Now there's a number of, systems out there that I have found, but they're all unconventional. None of them are accepted. Right. Um, like now, what? Okay. Well, there's, there's a several. Of them. There's two big ones, and there's a whole series of theoretical ones. The most useful one on the books at the moment in terms of renewables is actually geothermal. Now, geothermal energy, it's heat under the ground. Uh, you drill two pipes, two, two holes down in, you pump water in one, steam comes up the other, generate... Uh, turn a turbine, make electricity. That's useful when the heat is close enough to the surface. 
one of the innovations is is a deep drilling device that can drill holes very deeply, very quickly and cheaply. But can you drill a hole down to say to say uh, seven or eight miles deep, or, or you know ten or twelve kilometers deep, and you can do it quickly and cheaply? Whereas at the moment that's really really difficult to do. Now I've actually seen one of these concept drills, and I think and, and to me they work, and so this is to me is possible. And and if that happens, then geothermal might be accessible to, to many, many more sites than what it is now. Then the problem is, how do you actually get the steam up without going through all the cracks and joints that you'll drill through? Because it's holding pressure is going to be a problem. And then how do we get the heat from such a long way down up to the surface to be useful to turn a turbine? All right, so there's, there's a surgery required before it's ready. The other one that is ready to go now, but is, is extremely controversial to say, uh, it's a, it is an evolution of one of the existing energy sectors. All existing energy sectors, all of them have some sort of bottleneck and expansion. So one of them has to evolve. You know, is it solar? Is it wind? Is it hydro? Is it nuclear? So to me, nuclear has the best capacity to evolve into something else. The way it is at the moment, it's their best performer, but the system is so complex and there's, there's so many safety concerns associated with it. And you need such specialist training to be useful. And, and, and it takes such a long time to build a unit that, that it's, it's, it takes time to sort of expand. And I actually looked at, can the nuclear fleet expand uh, fast enough to be useful? And the answer is no. But if you were to take nuclear and evolve it into something else where the rules are different, then we might have something. So what I found... Well, what are you talking about evolving nuclear into something else? Okay, so what I found... It's actually in our past. We've already done this and have rejected it. Yeah, this burns my ass. This really does. <laughs> you're, you're kidding me, guys. All the trouble we've been put through and it didn't have to be this way. Right. 1972, there was a status report on, from Oakland Ridge Nuclear uh, Laboratory. The system is liquid fuel fission using um, a number of things as, as the fuel. Thorium is probably the pet preferred fuel, but you could have liquid metal, you could have your certain isotopes of uranium, and get this, it actually could also work with small volumes of spent nuclear fuel. We could actually burn through our existing nuclear fuel waste dump if we did it correctly, like you, you mix it in, with, you blend it in with everything else. So what, 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 what I'm talking about here is when you make a conventional nuclear fuel rod, fuel is in spheres. Like, and, and they put them in these assembly rods and you put them in the reactor and the reaction happens where radiation comes out of these spheres and bombards everyone else, er, uh, other spheres and causes a chain reaction. Right. It's the fuel on the surface that actually does this. But after a while, it all decays into something else. And the fuel in the center of each ball is not used because it can't actually get access to the outside. And so that's why... Uh, conventional solid fuel thorium fission is not very efficient because you've got to take fuel rods out and bathe them in acid to clean the surface while it's still radioactive and mm. then put it back in. Mm. Uh, and, and so it's just, again, that, that's too complicated and it's not worth the hassle. A liquid fuel system would, you, you, you put the fuel uh, into, into the system, like, like you use, let's say, a thorium fluoride salt, or you could have a uranium fluoride salt for that matter. Um, and you would then bombard the salt with neutrons from, say, a proton lamp or something. And that uh, the thorium um, is a fertile element. It's not radioactive, which means it's faintly above ra background radiation, but it's not radioactive enough to have a classification. So you, you, it's a fertile material, and you can get it to decay to uranium, a uranium isotope called 233. It's got a half-life of 28 days. So that uranium then heats up the salt and it melts and it becomes a fluid. And then the fluid will then pass in a circuit around the reactor and it would interact with the heat reservoir and heat transfer would happen. And the heat would then be used to make steam, which would then turn a turbine. Right. So as the fuel is going around the reactor, all parts of the fuel get to interact with all the other parts of the fuel and nothing is trapped. So if you've got something that doesn't, decay readily it's not going to shield anything else it's just going to sit in that fuel till it's either burned up 
or it's part of the final material that doesn't get burned, which is now when you put in a conventional nuclear uh, system based on, say, uranium-238 with an enriched proportion of uranium-235, it's about 4% by the time you enrich it. And the uranium-235 is what's actually generating the useful reaction. Uranium-238 is not that useful. So by the time the 235 is all used, you're taking 96% of the mass out, and it's still radioactive as. It's really hot. And that's when you've got the problems of storage and handling. All right. The thorium fuel goes in. Let's say one ton goes in. About 95, 96% of the fuel gets burned, burned up. And the remaining, you know, four or five percent of whatever it is, or it, in some what some reports it says as low as one percent. But a, a much, much smaller fraction doesn't get consumed. And then what happens is you take that stuff out. And then you can extract it. And you can extract, because it's liquid, you can extract it while it's running, whereas the other reactors, you've got to sort of shut it down. Anyway, so, so you've got a system here that that um, I've got a status report you know, from the source, Oakland Ridge Universe, uh, uh, Nuclear Laboratory, 1972. And this is basically saying it works. It's fine. Um, right. But then there's a lot of stuff in the literature that says it doesn't work. And so, so what's sort of going on here? And um, I'm a bit sort of cynical about what's going on here because back in the day, um, this is in the 70s, early 70s, the Cold War was raging. There was no energy shortage. The military was holding the cards of the day and they said, look, we want a, a uranium civilian system, nuclear system, which means we can actually camouflage the production of nuclear weapons. You know, through the uranium plutonium circuit, that can be camouflaged amongst the civilian nuclear system. If we go thorium, we can't do that. Hmm. And there's more money to be made with uranium. Let's go that way. And, and, and in terms of bang for your buck, uranium is actually more efficient. So thorium went by the by, but they didn't care about the waste. Yeah, well, we don't care. Uh, and, and all the safety issues with uranium that thorium doesn't have wasn't aware of them at the time. So, so we have been conditioned and encouraged to go for uranium and reject thorium. And in the literature, uh, especially the more modern stuff, we are being encouraged to go not look at liquid fuel and go to solid fuel. We are directed to solid fuel, which is not practical. And, and you know, when you're actually sort of uh, reviewing, say, PhD students, but with, a, with a, you know, their yearly review, and every now and then you get a student that's trying to gaslight you because they haven't done any work. The kind of language they use, I saw that language in mm. some of these reports. And I say, yeah, right, okay. Good. And, and so seeing the corporate world, you know, money talks and bullshit walks. And that's what I think has happened. So what I suggest we do now going forward is to actually have a look at this. It may well be the case that there are problems that it won't work out very well, but let's have a look. Because I also have it on reasonable authority that... Um, there's a system in operating in China right now in the Gobi Desert. Two megawatts, it's up and running, it's producing electricity, and they're selling it commercially. It doesn't need water to cool down, and it's operating as perfectly stable. Right. And so when I was in Hong Kong in a, in a presentation, I asked one of the officials there, and they said, yeah, yeah, this operate. It's, it's going, it, it seems to be okay, and, and the Chinese government is actually pursuing this now. Meanwhile, in the West, we are hanging our hat on a 50s generation light water reactor uh, technology. <laughs> so, and, and then a, a colleague of mine that I've known for some time now said, oh, yeah, I'm advising this group in Sweden called Co Atomic Copenhagen uh, Cap uh, and, and um, uh, Copenhagen Atomic. Uh, and, I said, and they're actually doing this as well. And they'll have a functioning reactor by 2025. Right. And I'm going, well, gosh, guys. <laughs> Um, because was, what that means is all cards are not on the table. So it's still not clear whether this is the thing that's going to change everything for us or is this a stepping stone to something else. But we've gone from there are no options to now there might be an option. Right. That's what I want to go for. And, in fact, what I'm planning for me next is going to be a combination of can we look at that and can we look at geothermal? So nuclear and geothermal. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I'm looking at at the moment. I'm quite happy to be told there are other things as well, as long as someone gets off their ass and does it. Keyboard warriors, they drive me nuts. Right. Um, 
So I've, I've heard uh, that electricity is 20% of the, of the energy that we use. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is that fossil fuels are energy dense. And uh, part of that is that you have to, some things require high temperatures that require burning something. Like if you're going to mm -hmm. process concrete or steel, yeah, uh, you have to get very hot temperatures that electricity cannot produce. You've so. got a front then. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. Sorry. No, you, you didn't interrupt. I'm just trying to, so, you know, I'm, I'm hearing nuclear and geothermal. I think electricity in both cases, you know, maybe there are some instances in which we can power by electricity what we're currently powering with fossil fuels. Um, those are not two totally separate things, but anyway. So we need heat. You've actually right. touched, you've touched on something that's quite important and it's it's another one of these blind spots that we seem to have at the moment is what would happen if we lose coal we've been all focusing on oil and lately gas but coal is actually you know a problem as well so when we actually sort of make a solar panel with the silver wafers in it you've got to heat the you've got to first of all take you know metallurgical grade silicon which is very pure quartz and getting that purity quartz is not necessarily that easy either but you take that quartz and you heat it up to 2,200 degrees Celsius. And that's a lot. Like a nuclear reactor runs at about, you know, say, five, 600 degrees Celsius. Mm. Right. And, and, and smelting, um, smelting steel, for example, needs around, you know, 2,300, two to 2,000, you know, maybe 2,500 degrees Celsius. So we're talking about melting steel temperatures. At the moment, we use coking. Well, the Chinese, we don't do it at all now. The Chinese use coking coal. To do that you take away their coking coal and it says right now you've got to generate the temperature how do you do it now there's a couple of ways you could do it in theory that have been shown at the lab scale one is to use um, biofuels like a particularly well-refined biofuel that's quite expensive now if we talk about the amount of heat needed that we use in manufacturing and say we're now going to source this from biofuels the planet cannot produce that much biomass Right, there are serious sustainability limits there. So, so that's not going to, we, we actually cannot produce that volume to actually hit the targets that we are hitting now. The second one that, that, that they flagged was the use of hydrogen. So now we're talking about an enormous amount of hydrogen, right? So that we're going to make the hydrogen and then we were before. Uh, and so how do we make so much hydrogen? And again, this is a quantity thing. Think about steel is being made and the fact that we're banked on that it can be done cheaply. And in, and in volumes, the volumes are enormous. And, and, and when you actually start looking at those quantities and then doing the calculations of how much materials you will need to do that, again, practical limits will impose themselves very quickly. The third one was an electric arc furnace, which can be used in some circumstances, but that's very, very intensive in terms of electricity. Uh, and again, we're back to if we went purely electric arc furnace, now we need we, we need some other heating element to do other things. This will only do one part of the process. And, and so even if we extended that out, now the electric grid is much, much larger again. So what I'm saying here is if you take coal away, much of our manufacturing will simply stop. Right? It's, it's, not, it's not just a question of finding green alternatives there. It's we don't have alternatives that are that, 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 that certainly alternatives that have been thought out in terms of quantity. Uh, at the moment, we've got a few theoretical concepts that, that haven't really been sort of properly thought through. And <laughs> this is a big problem. And, and if I had the time, this would be my next major piece of work. Uh, but chances are I'll be doing other things by the time we get to that. But, uh, so, but the whole heat, where do we get heat from? How do we use it? What temperatures do we need? That absolutely has got to be part of the future lexicon because our manufacturing depends upon it at literally all directions. And it's, it's sort of like everyone takes that for granted, like it's easy somehow. Well, I've heard, uh, I think, I heard this from Art Berman, and he <clears> said that there are four things that modern civilization depends on that, are all, that all require fossil fuels. One is concrete, one is steel, one is plastic, and one is fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to 
uh, imagine a scenario where we can continue to have steel, concrete, plastic, and fertilizer on the quantities that we have without fossil fuels. So yep. I, I wouldn't be, I personally, speaking for Hart Hagen, wouldn't be shedding a tear if much of our industrial civilization was seriously downsized. But there's a, there's a current, a cultural current that mm. says we just have to switch to 100% renewable energy. Like it's going to be this fine. easy be transition fine. if we just get behind it. Yeah. And that's a, Art Berman is actually one of the more sophisticated analysts that we've got at the moment. And uh, I encourage all listeners to have a look at him. Him and Nate Hagens, it's in the details. They're brilliant detailed guys. So yeah. um, he's absolutely right. And I think Vaclav Smil was the, uh, uh, was the original analyst that came up with those four, and they're absolutely correct. Hmm. So you can do these things in a small scale, but you try scaling them up to the quantities we're consuming now, and then say we're going to rebuild society. <laughs> so so I'm coming to the conclusion now that whoever comes up with a solution next, and I'm going to work on a few things, and let's say I'm successful. They'll only be successful in a very small scale, which means they'll help a small number of people, not a large number of people. Right. So what happens to everyone else? Well, well now we're back to the drawing board. Well, let's talk about the, the decision making process. So you're coming forth with these compelling arguments and, and data and you're meeting with a lot of resistance. How much of that resistance is strictly scientific and objective and how much of it is something behind the scenes that doesn't quite add up? So um, I would say the vast majority of what I'm meeting is ideology, a belief. We have a belief and it turns out we're not a scientific database society at all. We're an emotional belief-based species mm -hmm. that we decide what we believe in first, and that tells us what data we're prepared to accept. Then we'll look at the data. Right. And so it, 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 especially if that belief is very comforting and what's being proposed to them takes that comfort away, it, destroy, it destroys the you know, emotional security of their worldview. That don't want, that they really don't want to know. You know, you know there's, there's a, so 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 most of what I've sort of come across, um, it's it's happening in two frequencies. One is because I've put things in a particular language that p people aren't normally seeing, so it gets past the trip normal tripwise, and then people actually look at it and they go, oh yes, that might be a problem, right? So they're prepared to look at it. I'm not being thrown out of the building, which is what's happened to most people like me. Like, I don't consider myself um, noticeably smarter than most other people around me. It's just I happen to see things differently and I put things in a different order. And I was at the right place at the right time and I stumbled past the conventional tripwires and people saw it. And now we're all away. And, and, and that's what the, when you actually look at my work, it is actually very simple, very, very simple in form. And most people would be able to do it once told what to do. So, so. What I'm now seeing is, is people will look at it, but they can't get their arms around it. Verbally, they'll say, yeah, we've got a problem, don't we? Yeah. Hmm. What, but then they says, what do we do about this? And that's where the conversation stops, was that's when paralysis sets in. It's so fundamental that um, finance will have to stop, and then something else will have to take its place. Industrialization will have to stop. Uh, food distribution would have to... Like, like, it's like it's in a place most people can't see. It's not that they're refuting the ideas. They just don't know how to process them and have a credible response other than we're done. <laughs> well, well, here's an idea that I think is one of the elephants in the room, and that is that, um, you know, in a relatively short time, the last few hundred years, we've had this rapid increase in the amount of energy that we use, the amount of fossil fuels that we use. And that is reaching a peak and there's going to be a peak at some point in time. Mm -hmm. Some people say there's not going to be a peak. There's nearly infinite amount of fossil fuel, et cetera. And then some people are saying, look, it's a limited resource. We're using increasing amounts every year and there's going to be a peak. So, and, and what we've never seen is 
a world where we use less energy next year than we did this year. We've just never no. seen that. No, we know not not yet, not 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 for as long as our history has been recorded. So it comes down to: Do you believe the data that's coming in? So, and and then what data do you prepare to look at? Because people will often will look at some st um, streams of data but ignore others, and you know the energy return and energy investor debate is very vulnerable to this. So you've got not only is it energy, but it's our technology to extract and use that energy, and it's the natural resources we extract to make that technology. Right. So it's just those three things that are coming together, and they all interact with the natural environment. Right. So, uh, OK, we, we still have an enormous amount of oil left and gas left and coal. OK, but we've, we've gotten all the high quality stuff and consumed it. So now we've got the less quality stuff and we've got to use greater technology. There's, there's more refining steps and, and, and everything. So, so what technology are we using and is that technology as effective to get like vast parcels of energy for relatively little effort? more and more effort is now being required do you accept and believe that because if you do then it's all right okay we're getting it's not so much a peak of um oil uh, uh, found or, or consumed or something it's a peak of oil extracted in a useful fashion and it's going to be it's, it's soon will be the path of least resistance to do something else and so you have that three-way pull push pull thing and, and i suppose you could say money is a fourth stream because that's the decision-making system we use to decide who owns what and who does what. And so, yeah, and so, so I, I, I can see a situation where we will indeed see a peak. Like, like, but, the, but, but the idea of peak oil, for example, has to evolve. You know, some of Art Berman's work has shown very well to me that we may, have, may well and probably have seen peak oil in November 2018. But what does that actually mean? Because, because we're actually sort of increasing uh, gasoline and petroleum products by extracting them out of biofuels and um, natural gas liquids. And so we're forcing the, the gas industry to supplant and support part of the oil industry. But the outcome is we are able to increase production. So oil may be peaking and declining, but now pressure has been put on gas. The problem is it's very, very, very inefficient, and we can get away with it in the short term, but it will accelerate the peak for gas, which is still you know a number of years away. Right, and and, and so the the concept of peak oil maybe you know may well be 2018, right? But that's not the peak, that that's not the pain threshold of um, our um, what we bring to the market. That's actually going to be controlled by other things now. So every time we hit the idea of peak energy. It's, got, it's attached to so many other things. So you need system style thinking to catch this. And you've got to involve as many things as you can in that system's thinking. And then you might be able to diagnose trouble before it's coming. Right, a lot of our financial problems are in that boat as well. So here, here's um, one thing. I'm not sure if I'm changing the subject or not. This is just what I always get back to. And that yeah. is... <clears throat> Can we talk about questioning the end activities, like the end use of whatever energy we're producing and uh, storing? What is it going to? And it seems like we have a society with too many entrenched interests that benefit from what we're doing to be able to question that end use, whether it's related to war or pesticides or deforestation or what have you. Yep. You, you've nailed it. War, we are right. <laughs> um, so it's it, what's happening to us at the moment um, is entirely a, uh, in line with a civilization that's actually hitting resource and energy, energy constraints. You know, it's and, and the tragedy is the people on the ground are being devastated in ways that it, it just doesn't have to be that way if we learn from history and we learn from each other. But yes, all these vested interests, and there tends to be a relatively small number of people are holding controls. But for them to actually uh, allow evolution to happen, they've got to seed power. They've got to release power to other people, and that, that, that's not in their lexicon. So what 
I believe is coming is the idea that if we have limited amounts of energy and resources, we've now got to think very carefully with a long view. OK, we're going to extract these resources and energy. What for? What's it used for? Who's going to do it? What's the outcome? What's the impact of that outcome, short term, medium term, long term on society, our industry systems and the planetary environment? Is this a good idea? Should we do it? Right. And so the European circular economy and I guess the steady state economy as well were attempts to try and put the architecture in place to start thinking in those terms. Unfortunately, the social systems that come with that are often accused of being you know, communism or socialism, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. And so and automatically we start tripping over ourselves at that point. So to, to me, every single ism in, we've seen in the past, capitalism, communism, fascism, feudalism, all of them, they've all been contingent on growth, mm. expansion, whether it's growth in, in, in profit or growth by conquest, right? Um, so that, that includes communism. And yes, yes, it failed, right, because it, it did not actually um, honour human nature. So on one hand, we've got to honour human nature, but also collectively work together somehow. And that has not happened before. So whatever is coming, if we are successful in developing a new social contract where we are stable, it is unprecedented and has no name at the moment. And until then, it's going to be one big old mess and we're going to see every human strategy we've ever seen before, and they will all fail <laughs> because they always have. Uh, and so a big old mess, can we work together? Can we develop something new? That, that, is it really the case where we think that we've already thought of all ideas and we can't think of anything else? Is that really the case? Uh, so, well, it, it's, yeah, Another issue I always get back to is the media. <clears throat> Um, yeah. which you might define that as what are the technologies and platforms that, that we're currently using to communicate, who controls those platforms. Yep. And, um, we, we, you know, you're talking about these powerful interests that, ha that ha are invested in the system as it is, and they don't want it to change like oil companies that don't want us to know that oil is running out. And they mm -hmm. have an interest in perpetuating the myths and perpetuating the lies, which if we if it weren't for the myths and the lies we might use the internet to actually collaborate and yep. share information and things like that yeah well we socially have abdicated responsibility for our future and we've now allowed others to do our thinking for us and our decision making for us and we think that's normal right no, no we're sheep now that don't even need a sheepdog and here we are so if we were to genuinely think for ourselves, but also t we're also in a place where we're in total isolation of the consequences of our choices, right? So, so when I go down to the shop and I buy some mm. stuff, I've got no idea where that material came from, but I hand over my piece of plastic, you know, this, this, this uh, FPOS card, and I wave it in front of the machine and they, they give me the stuff and I take it away. I've got no idea where this material came from or what the footprint was. And when I eat the stuff and I throw the wrappers away, you know, I, I put it in the bin, and as far as I'm concerned, my part is done. That's how we, we, we think. When actually, both coming in and going out, there's, there's a whole system associated with the flow of materials. And at the moment, we're in isolation where we think a lot of the things that happen around us are not our problem and not our responsibility. Neither is true. So we've got to evolve to the point where the average person has got to lift their game and actually become more situational and aware more more information of quality that can then be used with quality actions less information of low quality because we are in a sea of low quality rubbish energy information at the moment right and and that's destroying our bandwidth so there's a number of things that imply there that we've got to evolve socially and we've got to step up and grow up grow up show up clean up all that stuff. So, yeah. so you spent some time in organic farming and have some insights some firsthand knowledge and experience with that. It seems like uh, it, uh, organic farming and, and how we get our food is one of the, uh, you know, one of the main variables, one of the things certainly that's easiest to understand and implement. Mm. So yeah. what would that so look we, like? 
so we've got to do that. But it's again, it's all been done in a different context in the past. I, there is, ah, one of the books I'm looking at at the moment. This, can you see it? So this is Not Plant quite. Empowerment. Hold it all closer, please. Hang on. Plant Empowerment. Okay, great. This is a textbook. Um, a friend of mine, um, Alex, if you're watching, thank you for this. Um, <laughs> Alex is one of my beer drinking mates um, here in Finland. Um, he he works in a um, peat growing uh, company. So there's a combination of how we grow things organically, but also how we grow things at the, at the moment. And both sectors have knowledge that is useful. Uh, people grew things in small scale organic in the past was that's the way we were set up. It's going to be very difficult for us to go back to that now because of the way we're sort of set up technology and, and also the knowledge of the people this, this, the knowledge to grow food has actually been lost and we have to learn it again. What I think is going forward is we will use the concepts of organic farming, which is now like regenerative farming. The idea with that we grow food in a way we're in harmony with the natural systems. And when we grow food, we're actually regenerating the soil and regenerating the natural bio systems in and amongst the food. Then we've got the principles of permaculture where we're looking at how plants interact, how, you know, the weather interacts, you know, the watershed, uh, how, how the whole system interacts. And so one's macro scale, one's micro scale almost. Um, and these are elements and building blocks that we will use to build the next system. Because the next system could well involve industrialization where if you had to, like one of my jobs was to make compost. And I'm there with a fork turning this over every day and, and, and making things rot. And <laughs> right. I remember thinking, can't we do this some other way? <laughs> um, um, uh, yeah. So what if we were to use some sort of an industrial technology where we were to collect, for example, human sewage and human waste products of, say, food and the grey water that comes off our, uh, um, our society, instead of pouring it down the drain, put it all into a digester and make the equivalent of compost and a series of fertilizer teas and then use technology or industry in some form to then transport large quantities of that and disperse it amongst the local community. So you're getting large quantities of nutrients coming to the land that are organic in form and can be used in form. And, and if we do things like no-till agriculture, which is actually much healthier for the soil than our conventional stuff, the productivity is not as high. And so at the moment, everything's geared for productivity and efficiency, except a reduction in productivity in exchange for long range sustainability. So a smaller number of people will have to spread out over a wider area. What that means is our cities, which are highly densely populated, will have to de uh, decentralize and, and, and people will then move out mm -hmm. uh, across. There's, there's large tracts of open land, right? But if we were to restructure things differently, because it's now the path of least resistance. And then when we do that, we did things differently. It'll be, uh, and, and, and what I was just saying is food production and growing of food using natural elements will have to be in a form that is merged with our energy and our technology and our human society. It has to be one system, one relationship, and it has to be fundamentally different to what it is now. And what that looks like, I can only guess. I can, I can sort of see the boundary conditions, um, so I don't claim to have the answers on that. And so it might be, you know, multiple stages of development and evolution. Again, it's going to be very hard to do that for 8 billion people next week. So I'm going to start with a small number of people and we're going to make a go of it. Give that a red hot go and see what happens. Right. And right. if it works, then we might be able to tell others and other groups might expand. What everyone else does, that's a different matter. What do you think should be the end goal? What what what, what is a, a common shared goal or destination that we should be interested in that can lead in the right direction? So we've got to learn how to merge in a harmonious fashion human society, technology, energy, commodity resources, production of food in with the natural environment where it's harmonized that we're like part of the environment. 
and that what they what you end up with is uh, a genuinely sustainable human civilization that has become wise right uh, uh, and, and so so how do we have a meaningful relationship with the planet and a meaningful relationship with ourself in contexts where we last longer than you know 200 years because at the moment our, our, our cycles only last a couple of centuries mm -hmm. do we really want to be here 10,000 years from now if so sort yourself out Okay, Simon, you wanted to, uh, what else did you want to talk about? Right. So what I've noticed over the last 20 years of work, working in this field, there's a lot of problems on, on the books at the moment. And I'm hearing a lot of lay, intellectual laziness in terms of, you know, what do we do about it? And I'm hearing a lot of uh, fear and judgment in terms of, there's, there's this feeling that humanity should be punished for its sins and that you know, we should all just sit down and wait wait for death and and, and we shouldn't do anything further and there's and any attempt to try and problem solve is met with resistance and and the very same people who would normally help you suddenly start attacking you it's a very strange dynamic it um, anyway so on one hand I hear things like these problems aren't worth talking about. Human innovation is an amazing thing. Someone will sort out something. Now, how many times have you heard that? Mm -hmm. Now, what that actually does, though, is it shuts down any discussion about the problem. First, mm -hmm. you need to understand the problem. Then you need to start working solutions. But the moment problems start arriving, people will termite you with that statement. And what they're saying is, you're making me uncomfortable. Stop telling me that my worldview my, the, the emotional security of my worldview is being pulled apart, right? And so what they're, they're, they're using that to shut down problem solving. So that's got to stop. On the other hand, when you do start talking about solutions, then there's the idea of, well, there's 8 billion people on the planet. And there is a school of thought that there's just too many people. And so, all right, okay, uh, that's a tough one. Then again, most people I talk to don't want to know about these things. They really don't want to know. So instead of trying to talk to people, uh, you know the phrase, never teach a pig to sing. Not only do <laughs> you waste your time, you upset the pig. Right. So I've learned the hard way that if, if people don't want to hear this, don't waste your time with them. Right. Find like-minded people, and they tend to be a relatively small group of people. So leave everyone else to it, and if, and if, and if they work out fine, we can trade with them. Find a small group of people. And what that means is instead of trying to find a solution for 8 billion people, mm. you're now trying to find a solution for a small group of people, maybe a single town. Okay. So now the prepper community uh, comes into play. And they've sort of been sort of thinking about that. But the prepper community has also been thinking in terms of we have to do things in a way where we have to take care of everything ourselves, which means we, we're going to simplify back to, say, an 1880s level of development with, say, the odd example of 1930s technology and a very rare example of 2020s technology. That's the prepper thing. What if the prepper community was handed a disruptive technology that changed everything, right? That changes the rules. How do we find that technology and how do we develop it? Also with the understanding is we're not trying to do it for 8 billion people. Now I'm trying to do it for, say, 200,000 people. Different proposition. Right. So... And to do that, you've then got to problem solve to a different set of metrics. What is it you're trying to achieve? How are you trying to achieve it? Our mentality has got to be uh, uh, one of, um, we've got to change the rules of what's possible. What's possible and what's not possible. Then we've got to decide who are we really? You know, what kind of world do we want to live in? Uh, do, do we let hate dictate our thinking? Or can we let imagination and collaboration dictate our thinking? And then look behind the curtain, go down the rabbit hole, see things where they really are. Because we're told so much bullshit, so much illusion. At all levels of society, we are a society that's based on illusion. Look behind that illusion. And from inside the rabbit hole, start problem solving. <laughs> so what I would encourage people to do and to think, in terms of it's okay to accept 
the mistakes of the past and put them behind you and move forward looking into the future with open hearts and open minds. And the person next to you could be your solution if they're of a like mind. And to be open to collaborating with that person instead of walling yourself off from that person. And if the majority of the people around you are not interested in what, what you're trying to do, that's okay. Let them sort their own problems out. And if they're successful, learn from them. And if they're not successful, work at how you're going to interact with them without being taken down yourselves. This gets to your idea of like the four archetypes or the four types of people. That's right. The, and the, the new Arcadians are one of those, right? Yep. Yep. That's right. The Arcadians are the long range, the people who are going to make the long range sustainable civilization. And they, you know, they, they would work closely or be embedded in the prepper community who would look to the short term, let's grow our vegetables, let's see to our um, our own needs. But the but the people, you know, the um, series that the, the, the books Winnie the Pooh, the, the, the donkey, Eeyore, he walked mm -hmm. around with a black cloud over his head on his He says, that kind of thinking is not going to get us anywhere. Right. Right. So if, if we allow the negative to dictate terms now, we're done. That's what I would encourage people to think in terms of. And so what it requires is in the face of adversity is to try and think positive within and make the best of what you have with what you uh, make the best of what you have with what you've got and build from there according to a different set of rules i'm going to try and do that and i need other people to do it with me so i'm hearing like take responsibility get engaged uh we need less hate and more mm -hmm. collaboration and creativity right exactly and that that sounds like a very sort of fluffy sort of Thing to be thinking about but when we're talking about energy and resources and where do we get them from we're discounting solutions based on ideology hmm. <laughs> and, and and some of the solutions that we're putting on the on the books at the moment are ideology and won't work and we are destroying any attempt to put anything else on the table so we think we've got the solution so what ideology are you talking about right so there's a couple of them uh, first is the ideology of growth. Um, the world will always grow. We don't need to worry about constraining our, uh, our thing. Our energy is not a concern. That's a cost. Everything's economic. It, it, these are ideologies. The next one is um, uh, green transition. Um, solar panels and wind turbines are the future, the end. We've got the solution. It's done. Stop your whining. You're being a negative Nancy if you're going to try and tell me there's a problem with that. Um, th 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 that's an ideology. We're not to the point where we've got a feasibility study to back that up yet. Right. And so some of the solutions I've also talked about, like the, the liquid fuel fission, that's another ideology that we need to check out if it's correct or not. Right. And, and, and so, so, so I'm saying, we will do this. No, no, we're going to look. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't work, we'll think of something else. Mm -hmm. It's an attitude. And so, so we tend to be very tribal, and each tribe has a, a, a narrative, and that narrative is enforced on everyone else. Whereas uh, I would like us to see a return to the idea of the ancient Greeks of what they thought a debate was. A debate is where a group of people sit down and they debate something with the objective of learning something. And it's not a question of who wins or loses that debate. It's everyone's learned something. Whereas at the moment, a debate is who can destroy who with their narrative. Right. Right. We've got to get rid of that. That's that's what I would like to see. Sounds like a winning formula. Let's just let's destroy each other. With, let's, let's, <laughs> you know, let's dominate each other. Let's marginalize other people. And that's the way to the promised land. Right. So my 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 solution is to get a small number of people disappear over the horizon Everyone else that wants to dominate each other and flame each other in tribal wars, you do that. And I'll come back in 10 years' time with a different, a, an entirely different prospect, and we'll see who prospers. Right. Well, Simon, this has been a wonderful conversation. You're really one of the leaders in uh, thought as to what the future is actually going to look like 
or at least some of the, uh, anyway, uh, and um, tell us a little bit more about your work at uh, Geological Survey of Finland and how people can follow you. So I've made a website um, and you could possibly put the website in the chat. So every time some work actually comes up, I'm, I'm going to put that into the actual chat. SimonMichaud.com. So all one, all one word, lowercase, SimonMichaud.com. That's my website where I try and put all my work on. It's not a perfect website. I'm doing it on my own, and I'm not a professional at this. So people seem, tend to uh, give me a flaming for that, but the information's there. Mm -hmm. The work in GTK goes into an archive. Uh, I collaborate and work with others. Um, it is a world-class scientific organization. Um, and a lot of the work is, you know, your, your classic science where it involves a lot of work that's, that's, that's quite tedious, but that tedious work leads to breakthroughs. Um, so we, we are looking at the science of geology and we're looking at the um, how the mining industry operates and being an impartial observer of how all that happens. We're writing papers and we're writing reports. Most of my work so far has been in what's called an open file work report because they're simply too large to publish. My work is coming in out in the GTK bulletin in peer review. It's in second round of review at the moment. It's been in review for 18 months. Um, um, and uh, what they're worried about there is the size of the, uh, it's, it's 240 pages of all calculations, all numbers, all coming out. And uh, I also think that 99% of the pushback I've had on social media is I'm not peer reviewed. That's actually not true. My work's been peer reviewed from the beginning. But if these reviewers let me into peer reviewed space, then all of that has to go. And I think they're very aware of that responsibility. Hmm. Um, uh, the work I've done at GTK is the best of my career so far. 